Hello, everyone. My name is Ian Hensel, and I'm the managing publisher here at Rattling Good Yarns Press. Last year, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, the event that triggered the modern pride movement. In 1969, a group of courageous LGBTQ people fought back against police oppression at the Stonewall Inn, a gay bar in Greenwich Village, New York. This year marks another 50th anniversary because 50 years ago on June 28th, 1970, the first Pride Parade was held. At the time, it was called the Christopher Street Liberation Day Parade. You know, 50 years ago, there wasn't much in the way of literature or art uh, around gay topics. At best, it was hidden, um, underground, or in pulp type of fiction. I thought it would be interesting to gather a group of our Rattling Good Yarns authors and artists together to talk about how the pride movement has impacted their writing. So now let me introduce the panelists for our discussion today. The first panelist I'd like to introduce you to is Owen Keenan. Owen is a historian and author. His works explore the events, meeting places, and personalities that have molded the rich history of Chicago's LGBTQ community. Owen is the co-editor of the very popular Tell Me About It series from Rattling Good Yarns Press. By asking LGBTQ people around the world a set of simple questions, the Tell Me About It series reveals the commonality of the gay experience, even though we may be separated by the decades and by geography. Also with us today is Rick Carlin. Rick is an inductee into the Chicago LGBT Hall of Fame. He's a celebrated columnist and author. His new memoir, Paper Cuts, My Life in Chicago's Volatile LGBTQ Press, explores his time as a columnist and editor from the rough and tumble post Stonewall days of the LGBTQ press to the present. He watched the rise and fall of disco, the AIDS crisis, same-sex marriage, bars opening and closing, and LGBTQ newspapers coming and going. Paper Cuts is available now from Rattling Good Yarns Press. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Daniel Jaffe. Daniel is an award-winning author whose new collection of short stories, Foreign Affairs, Male Tales of Lust and Love, explores how red-blooded American men make mischief while vacationing abroad. They encounter a serial killer in a Munich bathhouse, a gay Holocaust ghost in Prague, a shape-shifting seductress in Mexico City, a desperate prostitute in Seville, and many others. Foreign Affairs will be available later this year from Rattling Good Yarns Press. Also with us today is Philip Gamboni. Philip Gamboni is an award-winning author of fiction and nonfiction. His collection of short stories, The Language We Use Up Here, was nominated for a Lambda Literary Award, as was his novel, Beijing. His essays and memoirs have appeared in a number of major anthologies. His latest work is, as far as I can tell, Finding My Father in World War II. Phil spent seven years uncovering who the man his quiet, taciturn father had been by retracing his father's journey through World War II. As far as I can tell, not only reconstructs what Gamboni's father endured, it also chronicles his own emotional odyssey as he followed his father's route from Liverpool to the Elboat River. A journey that challenged the author's thinking about war, European history, and civilization. As far as I can tell, we'll be coming out later this year from Rattling Good Yarns Press. Also with us today on our panel is Greg Shapiro. Greg Shapiro is also an inductee into the Chicago LGBT Hall of Fame. He is a journalist, poet, and author. His book of short stories, How to Whistle, is a collection of gay male-focused short stories that span the time from the 1970s through the 21st century. His funny, poignant stories explore the gay male experience through the decades. An expanded edition of How to Whistle, with new additional added short stories, will be coming out later this year from Rattling Good Yarns Press. 
Next, I'd like to introduce you to another inductee into the Chicago LGBT Hall of Fame, Saint Suki Delacroix. Saint Suki is an award-winning historian, author, and journalist. He is also the co-editor with Owen Keenan of the popular Tell Me About It series. Saint Suki is the author of Chicago Whispers, the groundbreaking history of LGBTQ people in Chicago from the arrival of the explorers through to Stonewall. Saint Suki is also the co-editor with Owen Keenan of the popular Tell Me About It series. We're very pleased to announce the release of the third volume in the popular Tell Me About It series, Tell Me About It 3. In Tell Me About It 3, Owen and Suki ask new questions that continues to reveal the shared experience of LGBTQ people around the globe. We're also very pleased to announce the upcoming release of Suki's latest novel, The Orange Spong and Storytelling at the Vamp Arts Cafe. It explores how vampires, much like immigrants, fled persecution to the new world where they share their stories. We're also excited that we will be releasing the Rattling Good Yarns edition of The Blue Spong and The Flight from Mediocrity. And finally, I'd like to introduce you to the very talented artist and illustrator, Roy Alden Wald. Roy is the illustrator of St. Suki's Strange Garden of Woodland Creatures, which is available from Rattling Good Yarns Press. Roy's remarkable talent and imagination brings to life the characters in the stories. Characters such as high heel wearing giraffes and the Warthog Philharmonic Orchestra. Roy and Saint Suki are currently collaborating on a new set of illustrated stories for Saint Suki's Lunatic Asylum for Demented Toys, a book set in an institution for mentally ill toys. We can't wait to see what that looks like. Thank you for joining us today, guys. So the question I want to put to all of you is how has the Pride Movement, or the Gay Liberation Movement, as we called it way back when, how has it impacted your writing and your creativity? Um, how has your work evolved with the evolution of the movement? So let's first start with you, Daniel Jaffe. I began writing seriously in the 1980s. And by then, the gay liberation movement was well underway, and I was reading gay and lesbian literature all the time. So when I wanted to start writing, exploring my own experience, I felt that my experience was very valid as a subject of literature, of, of writing. Uh, so it was a great help in that regard, gave me a lot of self-confidence. And also knowing that there was a whole infrastructure, there were gay and lesbian publishers. There were bookstores that would carry my work. There was a whole readership. So there was a real point to my writing. And just the way uh, the, the readers, the, the writers I had read helped me address some issues within myself, I was hoping that maybe I could help some readers by having them read my own experiences. So, so there was a real point to it. So the movement had clearly helped me with that. And then as the movement evolved over time, uh, as, as we all learned more, learned not just that there are gay and lesbian people, but what bi experience meant, what trans experience meant, asexuality. I started expanding my own awareness and thinking and meeting people with different orientations and, and gender identities. And that helped my writing because then I could include a broader array of characters and I could do so not based on stereotype, but, but based on real people I was knowing and better understanding. So the movements helped me at all different levels. Uh, so Daniel, you have a new collection of short stories, Foreign Affairs, uh, Male Tales of Lust and Love, coming out uh, this fall with Rattling Good Yarns Press. How do you think the movement is reflected, the pride movements reflected in that work? In, in Foreign Affairs, uh, I think it's very much what I was commenting on a little bit ago about 
the breadth of my understanding of different men's experiences in particular coming into play. Foreign Affairs is a collection of stories about uh, men's travel experiences, romances, dating experiences, lusty experiences. When I started the collection, I was focusing on gay men's experience. But then I thought, that's too limiting, and why not broaden it? So I expanded it to include straight male characters, bi characters, a trans character. So I think that having my own awareness expanded over the years has helped this collection be more of an expression of men's experience than it would otherwise have been. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, how about if we go over to you, Greg Shapiro? How did the Pride movement impact you? Uh, because I was a kid uh, at the time of the Stonewall riots, and then a year later at the time of the first Pride parades, uh, my awareness actually came a little bit after that when I was, uh, again, a kid. I had my first magazine subscription uh, to Life magazine, and in 1971, uh, there was an article about uh, in the year in review issue, there was a, a thing about gay pride and, and gay, uh, gay culture. And as a kid who kind of figured out that I was, you know, one of them, uh, it was exciting to see that. But it was years later, in the, about 78, uh, when I read, uh, in the same year, I read Dancer from the Dance by Andrew Holleran and Faggots by... Uh, the late Larry Kramer, and it was like a life-changing thing. I was, I had already, I had just started college, I was a theater major, so gay, 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 and um, so uh, all of this stuff was just right in front of me, um, and then uh, I moved to Boston to, to continue college. I transferred to Emerson College in Boston, and to be in Boston in the early 80s, it, there's just, I'm sure it was probably like being in New York or being in San Francisco because it was just so really exciting. And I was at Emerson College, which at that time was a, <laughs> was a pretty gay school uh, back then. And um, so I just sort of had this world in front of me. So I never hesitated at all to write about gay subject matter. It was something, uh, I was writing about it, actually even, I think when I first, when I was at Columbia College in Chicago and like in writing classes, I wrote about it then, but I wrote about it much more overtly uh, in at Emerson in the early 80s and I never had an issue. So I was very lucky to have uh, Holleran and Kramer and others to lay that groundwork for me. So, Greg, you have a book coming out later this year with Rattling Good Yarns Press. It's an expanded edition of your collection of short stories, How to Whistle. How do you think the Pride movement is reflected in, in that collection of stories? Freedom to write about that subject matter. I mean, I can't even imagine what it would have been like writing about that subject matter in the... 50s or 60s or so yeah I mean the the impact was total freedom to write about it uh, openly with humor really important to write about it with humor um, and yeah so I'm, I'm grateful for that uh, uh, as I said for the groundwork that was laid uh, before that so I could write about it thanks Greg um... Why don't we move on next to Rick Carlin. Rick, how has the Pride Movement impacted you and your writing? Part of the thing I've realized is over the years is that my writing has been, there's been a wider breadth of what I write about. Uh, before, a lot of it was coming out stories or characters fighting to get their families to accept them. And a lot of times when I'm writing now, the characters are basically at past that point. They're obviously not, you know, it doesn't matter what their parents think. It doesn't matter what their families think. They've moved on from there or that's been situated. 
that situation's all been dealt with already. And I'm moving from a separate point where they're farther along in the story. I don't feel like I have to do any kind of explanation for straight audiences anymore, you know, kind of laying the groundwork for that. And the most recent work I'm working on right now has, you know, the fact that one of the characters is gay is just one aspect of what the most important thing happening in the story is. And I find that that's, that's really how the gay pride movement has affected my work is that I don't have to do so much of the building the foundations for people to understand who aren't gay. It's, there's sort of a, a, an upper level now where we're, we're assuming people are, whether that's true or not in a lot of the country is different. But um, I think everybody, the entire world is a little bit better educated about what being gay means. And so we're freer to write about other things that explore other aspects. And of course your book, Paper Cuts, wouldn't exist without the Pride Movement, would you say? My, my uh, memoir is different from a lot of my other writing. And the memoir is about the Pride Movement, basically. It's about my life in it and how I got thrown in the middle of certain things. And so that's, that's a very different uh, aspect of my writing than my fiction and playwriting. Thank you, Rick. Let's now go over to you, Saint Suki Delacroix. How has uh, the movement impacted your writing? Well, I actually really, I was working for the gay press for 30 years, which is well, over 30 years, which is an education in itself. And one of the things I noticed when I came to the States was that when I look back at the gay newspapers before I started working for them, the early old gay life, I could not believe how incredibly white it was. And it was very male as well. Now, I later found out the reason it was very male is because a lot of the women were in the women's separatist movement and didn't want to be involved in that. So it's been my mission, one of my missions in life to actually document uh, what's happening, which is why I was a reporter, because I went to uh, every event. I was at the, you know, the uh, bondage club. I was at black lesbian parties. I, and, and even the log cabin Republicans, I went everywhere and I covered everything because I wanted all of our lives to be documented. I thought that was really important. And that's why I wrote the book about the history of uh, lesbian and gay men in Chicago because nobody else had written it. I waited three years hoping somebody else would do it and I ended up doing it myself. So, but, yeah, so the gay movement, I've kind of uh, mostly lost interest in it, to be perfectly honest. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's great. That means it's more accepted by everybody. And, uh, but no, I don't think of people being gay or straight or anything. But admittedly, for 12 years, I was married. I am a great grandfather. So sexuality has always been something fluid to me. And, um, and I grew up in the hippie movement, so I was reading the underground press, and they were the only press, and I want you to ask me about the book I wrote about this, they were the only press that covered gay issues in a positive manner. So I was reading about gay people. I read about Stonewall in a hippie newspaper called the International Times in England. So I did know about it, and you know, it wasn't even mentioned in the Chicago newspapers. You mentioned your book, out of the Underground, which is a history of the LGBT movement as seen through the underground press. So you obviously have some interest in the Pride movement. So in documenting life, which is why I do the Tell Me About It series, I think we have to be documented. I know with, uh, and Owen agrees with me on this, if when we, when we write our history books, we go back a hundred years and you can 
can't find out anything about the way gay people lived, the way they survived, where they hung out, unless they're famous like Oscar Wilde, you know. So I think it's important to document every single story, every coming out story, everything needs to be documented. In a hundred years, I want historians to look back and they can see the way we lived because Owen and I, when we look back, we can't find out how a gay plumber lived in 1926. We don't know, you know. I wrote Out of the Underground because, um, I'll tell you, I was writing Chicago Whispers and I was in the Harold Washington Library, which I lived in for months and months and months, with microfilm, you know, looking at microfilm. And then I saw this cabinet of microfilm I'd never seen. And when I looked in there, there was the largest collection of underground newspapers in the world. And it was just a dusty old cabinet. And I spent months going through making copies of all these wonderful papers, Australia, France, everything was in there. And I wrote the book out of the underground about the gay movement before Stonewall. It was documented in all these tiny little newspapers. Thank you, Suki. Let's now go over to Philip Gamboni. Uh, Phil, how has the Pride movement uh, impacted your writing? So when I started writing, um, I started writing poetry. This was 67, 68, 69, um, just as the gay liberation movement was going. And the world is a far better place for not having my poetry. It was, it was turgid, it was convoluted, um, and probably most of all, it was closeted. I was trying to say things without being explicit. And so I think for me, the, the gay liberation movement, the pride movement, um, gave me permission to start um, telling my truth and telling my stories um, in ways that I didn't have that permission before. I started writing a journal in 1968. I think I mentioned this in the last interview we did, um, Ian. And um, that was the first place where it felt safe to talk about my gay life in any kind of explicit way. Um, and then, um, like Greg, I discovered Andrew Holleran and some other gay writers. And that also gave me permission to start seeing that um, gay stories and gay life had a legitimacy and had a claim to being told to the world. Um, I guess the next stage in my evolution as a writer is that, um, like Suki, I wrote for the gay press. And being able to tell other people's stories, I wrote for Boston's Gay Community News and later Bay Windows. I think I wrote for Fagrag for a while, um, The Advocate. In, in um, writing other people's stories, again, I was giving myself permission to start thinking about uh, being able to write um, my own stories. So finally, um, probably in the mid 70s, I started, I, I took up um, fiction writing. And um, I've been going ever since as a, as a fiction writer, short stories, I've written two novels, one of which was published. Um, and now I'm working on a collection of short stories about older gay men, because I think that's another uh, aspect of gay life that probably has not been explored very much. So I'm very excited about um, beginning to tell the stories of, of older gay men and what their lives are like, what they're experiencing, what, what they're feeling. And your, your upcoming book from uh, Rattling the Germs, as far as I can tell, uh, which is a memoir of finding your father in World War II, how do you think, how do you think the movement uh, brought about or led to, or led to, to that, that book? Um, the movement didn't lead to that book, but the movement um, 
really inspired me to make a major change in that book. When I started thinking about that book eight years ago, it was just going to be um, a, a, the story of what my father went through during the war. And I was going to try to tell a story that he did not tell um, and piece together a story that, that he never told me. And um, I really wrestled with, uh, do I come out in this, in this book? It is part of this memoir about me, his gay son, who was uh, rejected um, by the army during the Vietnam War. Um, and it was about a year into the project that I realized that is an absolutely essential element in this story, that it would be, um, it would be disingenuous and it would be um, closeted not to uh, reveal that part of my interest in my dad's life was because of the parallel in my own life, that he, he was drafted and went to war, I was drafted and was rejected from the war. So um, very much so the, the, the pride movement didn't instigate that book, but helped me to, to turn it in a different direction. Let's move now to Owen Keenan. How do you think the pride movement has impacted your creativity and writing and how have you evolved with that? I think um, like Greg has mentioned, uh, I think my first entry into everything was sort of through reading. Only I didn't read Andrew Holleran or Larry Kramer. I read City at Night. So I was all about moving to the big city and becoming a hustler. That was like my dream job. Um, and that worked for a while for my writing because that's kind of what I wanted to do. I wanted to... Um, I wanted to immerse myself in kind of an underground world of writing. Uh, the pride movement for me was more the ability to express rather than um, rather than like a being out there and assimilating. I just was much more interested in sort of exploring the worlds of um, identity and what it meant to be gay um, as people sort of explored themselves being gay. And with, uh, with history, it's sort of been that way too, is I kind of, because I, I didn't know, like Suki mentioned, what those lives were about, a lot of my writing is sort of like using my imagination to kind of explore what gay life might have been like. Uh, for somebody who is a plumber in the 1950s or 1930s or whatever. Um, and that's really, that's really been my focus. And I think uh, it's gotten even more um, emphasized with uh, living through the AIDS epidemic when it became so much more about capturing and telling a story that even though liberation was there, those stories a lot of times just couldn't be told because there wasn't the opportunity. Um, I, uh, I tend to focus all my work specifically on the LGBTQ community and not even, um, not really go too much beyond that, not because of, um, of any political stuff. I just think for me, that's kind of the, um, uh, that's kind of what I'm interested in. Um, how has it changed? I, I think my, if anything, I, I think liberation has caused me to sort of, um, I don't think I have really evolved in that maybe I've explored the same topics, maybe in a little different way, but like I couldn't imagine writing about like young gay people today. I just think it would come off like some hideous thing when you're embarrassed for your, you know, like I would imagine when I was a kid and my parents would try to use today's lingo or something like that. Uh, 
but um, I just, I think gay liberation for me has been uh, in my writings, sort of that focus on knowing the fragility of history, that this is kind of a new phenomenon that we didn't have the opportunity to explore and trying to explore as much of it as I can because you know there's always a very good possibility um, given the state of the world that this could be wiped out again and it could be you know back to square one. Um, so that's it for me. So you've been working with uh, Saint Suki Delacroix on the Tell Me About It series. How do you think the Pride movement is reflected in in the Tell Me About It series of books that you've done? I think it's endlessly fascinating. Everybody has a story to tell. They may think they don't have stories to tell, but they do. I, I think it's fascinating how people, um, especially LGBTQ people vary in so many ways, but are similar in so many ways. Uh, a lot of the themes are, um, a lot of the themes are consistent. And even if there's something that I never even considered or thought about, I, uh, I just find it incredibly empowered. You can, you can hear the person being empowered a lot of times telling their story. As they're telling this story, and giving their narrative and what's happened to them and what they feel about something. It feels like it's doing really good work letting that person know that their voice is important and their um, experience is important. So that would, that's, I think, the main benefit that I've found from doing the series. Thanks, Owen. Um, before we go on, I see that uh, Rick Carlin, there's something you would like to add? Um, the whole thing about the intergenerational thing. I would love to see a book where young people and old people discuss coming out, what it was like for us coming out versus them coming out. I think that there, because I think young people don't have a clue as to how difficult it was for us. And old people, don't understand how for young people we they don't even think about it twice anymore it's like yeah i'm left-handed and i'm gay i mean that's really kind of the extent of it for many many people of course there are many places where kids are living in the same kind of repressive atmosphere that we all grew up in but there are also ones where it's just not even an issue anymore and there, that's a book that we need to have Rattling Good Yarns put out. Owen and Suki get to work on that one. You know, I know what you're talking about, Rick. Um, I, I don't have many conversations with younger uh, LGBT people, but the ones that I, I have had, I sometimes feel like some old codger who's saying, well, in my day, I had to walk three miles through the snow to get to school. Um, so, yeah, I think it would be really interesting to have uh, uh, something focused on intergenerational uh, gays. Um, maybe that's something we'll see from Owen and Suki or one of our other uh, writers in the future. And hopefully you'll see that from Rattling Good Yarns Press. So now let's move on to our final uh, panelist today, Roy Alton Wald. Roy, you're a little bit different from the other panelists. The other panelists are writers and you are an artist and an illustrator. So what's your take and how has the Pride Movement um, impacted your work? When I first moved away from home, I was still, a I mean, uh, I viewed myself as a straight person. I moved to Boston. I then experienced so many different things going on in my life, different people, different everything, that I, it just freed me, opened up my mind, 
I really enjoyed living there, finally coming to terms that I was gay. And basically, you know, having one uh, partner after another, but my first partner was a poet, a struggling poet. He, you know, was really trying to get, get his act together and everything. But I mean, he had issues and basically we didn't last very long, but it still inspired me to um, just free my mind on how to do artwork and not being so stodgy and illustrating. Because when I was in art school, it really, really stifled my creativity. It took me years to actually pick up anything that I really wanted to do something. Um, with my second partner, we were playing around with, you know, trying to do a gallery in our house, um, putting up our artwork, um, by that time, I wasn't painting anymore, but I was doing block printing and doing mono prints and stuff. I, I, the whole gay liberation for me, it was around 77 that I actually came out, that I was 20, 21, and it, I found that it was so easy that you know, coming out to anywhere that I worked or, or anything, ev everyone accepted me. They didn't give it a thought that I was straight, if I was gay, whatever, that living in Boston was really a great experience for me at the time. Moving around to different places in the country, um, I, I could see how people stay repressed, even though it's a big city, they just, it's hard to come out. Um, I just like what I'm doing now. I feel comfortable. I'm comfortable with the people that are my friends. I'm comfortable working with, with Suki. I mean, Suki's out there. And I really enjoy that. It just opens my mind even more. And I just want to do other stuff. Do other creative works and get even more expire, inspired. And, and I think you're famous in uh, St. Suki's Strange Garden of Woodland Creatures for bringing cross-dressing giraffes to life. Uh, who would have ever thought that anybody could draw giraffes wearing high-heeled shoes? That was complicated. <laughs> That was very complicated, but I, I really enjoyed that. It, I mean, j just trying to figure out the ana anatomy where it's still a giraffe, that it's not that much of a, uh, a cartoon, you know, like they look like hu little humans with little, little dresses and little pants or tank tops and, and shirts, but they're actually the animal that they are. And you can't tell by an animal unless they put something on. Thank you, Roy. And a special thank you to everyone for joining us today for this panel discussion. I wanna thank our panelists, Philip Gamboni, Rick Carlin, Greg Shapiro, Owen Keenan, St. Suki Delacroix, and Roy Alton Wald for being here with us today. Um, please check out our website, which you can find at rattlinggoodyarns.com. We have some great books coming out. Uh, you've heard about uh, Philip Gamboni's new work, uh, as far as I can tell, Finding My Father in World War II. Daniel Jaffe's new collection of short stories, Foreign Affairs, Male Tales of Lust and Love. Uh, the Tell Me About It 3 book is already available and ready to order. Uh, Paper Cuts, My Life in Chicago's Volatile LGBTQ Press by Rick Carlin, fascinating and entertaining read, is available to order. St. Suki has two new uh, novels out, The Blue Spong and The Flight from Mediocrity, and The Orange Spong, Storytelling at the Vampire's Cafe. You can order these books at Rattling Good Yarns 
www.thinkinglaw.com website. Um, and please consider joining our mailing list. As a small publisher, we are often challenged in getting the word out and our mailing list helps us incredibly. Uh, you can find out when we release Phil Gamboni's new book, when uh, Daniel Jaffe's new collection of short stories is available for order, and when we will be bringing out the expanded edition of Greg Shapiro's How to Whistle, an uh, excellent collection of short stories. Be the first to know about the release of these books by signing up from our mailing list. Also, please consider visiting our Facebook page and liking us on Facebook. That also is a tremendous help. So once again, thank you for being here today. My name is Ian Henslow. I'm the managing publisher and editor at Rattling Good Yarns. And I wanna wish everyone out there a very, very happy Pride.